I got the best hour. Just in the end of the day, <laughs> just before dinner. I'm the last barrier. Do you are the, hi the highlights? Ah, oh, okay. Yeah, highlights. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Everyone rested. Even I right. don't believe it. So we get Everyone is rested. Okay. <laughs> and this is the reason why they bring coffee now. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm like, I've been okay. Yes, that's zero. 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 <laughs> and that one is. Please do. I was like, I have, it was quite a lunch that I was Please do. Um, I would like to uh, claim in this lecture that um, while we think that monotheism sometimes is trying to minimize the freedom of speech, the biblical legacy is uh, trying to maximize the freedom of speech and <coughs> perhaps the academic world has what it has today only because the contribution of the biblical legacy. And I would like uh, to begin with a quote of um, Isidore Rabbi who was a Nobel Prize winner in 1944 and he said as follows, my mother turned me into a scientist without any intention of it. All the Jewish mothers in Brooklyn used to ask their son, did you learn anything in school today? But not my mother. She always asked me another question. Izzy, did you ask a good question today? That difference made me a scientist. Sometimes to, to ask a very good question is the beginning of a, a, a decent research, of a decent inquiry. And it begins a whole new dialogue, and we discussed this day, during this day about dialogues, and the beginning of dialogue is by asking a question. But perhaps we have to go to the, first, to the beginning and to go to Genesis. When we read in, in chapter 2 in Genesis about the creation of the human being, it said, and the Lord God formed the man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. There is a, an Aramaic translation to the Bible, uh, well known and well learned among many Jews. It's called the Unculus translation. And when he trying to translate what is the meaning of living soul, he is talking about a talking soul. When you want to say that you are living, you are talking. Now, it's not only the matter of talking. But you have to talk with many cultures and with many nations. And sometimes it's really hard to, to figure out how, how to do it. And this is why seven chapters later, we see the story of the Tower of Babel. In this, the story of the Babylonian Tower, we can see that it's the shortest story in the Bible, just nine verses. But it claims and it, you can find many major questions that perhaps there is uh, um, one major answer that may answer up on all these questions. And it's written as follows. And the whole earth was of one language and one speech. And it came to pass, as they journeyed from the east, and they found a plain in the land of Shinar. And they dwelt there. Can you see? Okay. okay. Now, so first of all, they are looking to, start to build a tower, but they say one to each other, go to, let us make brick, and burn them through, truly. And they had brick for stone, and slime it for the mortar. And they say, go to, let us build a city, as a city, and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven. And if you want to build a tower that will reach heaven, you are not looking for a valley. You are looking for a mountain. But they are looking for a valley. They are looking for a place, for a plain land, to build a tower. And they want to build a city, and they want to build a tower in the middle of this city. And they said, why they need to do so? Let us make us a name, lest we'll be separated abroad upon of the face of all earth. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower, which the children of men built. Now, why God is bothered from a creation of a city. And it's not that he is bothered, he is, he is troubled from it. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they have 
all one language. And this is they begin to do. And now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. Why not? All, you know, Marx and, and Angus just said it. All the nations, let's unite it. All the people of the world. So there is unique unity. Everybody talks the same language, doing the same idea, gathering around the same city. There is a one tower and everybody is going in one circle around it. Why it's so bad? And then, God even said that this is, this is just the beginning. Just the beginning? But they said that this is the end. They said that they want to build a city with a tower. They didn't say, we want to build a few cities. We want to build one city with a tower. And in the middle, he said, this is just the beginning and who knows what will happen. And they say, go to let us go down and there confound their language that they may not be understood one another's speech. So, the Lord scattered them, brought from them upon the face of all the world. And they left off to build the city. Therefore, is the name is called Babel, because the Lord did that, confuse their language of all theirs. Now, if they are sinners, kill them. If they are not sinners, leave them alone. Why do you try to make chaos. What is, what is the profit that you gain if you create a chaos and you split the, the humankind to a few nations? Now, one of, uh, there are a lot of commentaries around this, this uh, short story, and I would like to focus in one specific commentary written by um, a rabbi from Belarus in the end of the 19th century. His name was Rabbi Naftali Tzvi Yehuda Berlin. Rabbi Berlin was in a small uh, village next to Minsk. And um, this, is his, um, this is his yeshiva. And this is his grave in the, in, um, in, uh, the cemetery of Warsaw. And today there is a kibbutz next to in the Sea of Galilee. And Barilan is his name after his son, right? And there is a famous kibbutz right next to the Sea of Galilee after him, after his name. And he wrote a commentary, and you can find that there is something that related perhaps to things that uh, Dr. Schule mentioned when he talked about the fact that German that he came from a place where until eight, in 1989 you are under a socialist regime and under a totalitarian way of thought. And when he's trying to explain what happened there, Rabbi Berlin wrote as follows. They thought that all the cities should be subordinate to the main city with the tower. From that tower, people will be able to watch after all the citizens. Therefore, they had to make it high that its top may reach unto heaven. Why did they do it? Not that because they want to reach to heaven. They want to control the society. And when they say, let us make an, us a name, yeah? let us make, make us a name, they said, we should point people that will be in charge to follow the masses and to punish those who should be punished. Since the thoughts of the people are not the same, they were afraid that people will leave the common ideas and will adopt a new idea. For this reason, they were keeping that no one would leave their city. And if someone decided to leave their own one speech, he was sentenced to death, like they eventually did to Abraham. If they will finish the building of the tower, said God, they will be able to control the people and to avoid new ideas. And this is a thought that destroys the society, and therefore there is no use in the fact that they are united right now. The Big Brother is watching. The Big Brother project is not a new project. It's a very old project. And when they wanted to build a city, they wanted to control the discourse. And God says, guys, you can't promote the humankind if there is only one idea led by a few people that speaks the same language. You have to give many cultures to 
flourish. And to do so, and in order to do so, I have to create a chaos. I don't want them to gather around one tower in a small city in the plain state. I don't want it. I want them to be separated. And I want them to argue with each other. With each other. And I want them to build new cultures, new ideas. And this is what will promote them. Now, um, Rabbi, Rabbi Shapta just mentioned the, the famous story about Sodom and uh, the two versions, the, the Muslim version when, when uh, Abraham said to the angels, may God be with you, and uh, the Hebrew version when there is a, a negotiation. After all, God is coming to, to Abraham. God agrees with him. What? God agrees. Yeah. And um, two years ago, I, I met um, a colleague. I'm teaching also professional ethics and religion. And I met a, a colleague from, um, from Harvard. And he originally born and raised in, uh, in Ghana, in Africa. And he said, you know, when I'm asking myself, um, why there is a difference between Ghana and Israel. Because he said, listen, you got independence, let's say, more of the same like we got independence in the same years, and we have resources that you will never have. We have gold and diamonds, and what do you have? The Dead Sea? <laughs> this, is your best, this is your best resource? And he said, I can tell you what is the difference between both of, of our nations. And he said, I think that the beginning, the main reason is from Abraham. He said, if Abraham was an African, and God would come to him and would say, I'm going to perish dumb from earth, Abraham would say, you are God. You know what is right, what is wrong. And if you said this is the right act to do, may God be with you, God. <laughs> That's it. But if... The main reason, but if, uh, if because of Abraham, he has an Israeli soul, he said, and he has to ask questions. And he's trying to negotiate. Why to kill them? Maybe there are a few righteous people. Maybe 50. Maybe 40. You know what? Maybe now 40. Maybe 30. You know what? Not me, not you. 20. Let's make a price. Like, like in the bazaar in the middle of Istanbul. And he said, the same thing happened to you when you came here. People said, guys, this is the Dead Sea. Everything here is dead. You say, says who? Why not? Let's try to grow tomatoes, <laughs> cherry tomatoes. Why not? Let's try it. And this is, the, the, the roots are coming from the same, the same uh, ideas that you always have to challenge God. And God is saying in... in Already, when in his, during his decision um, regarding the Babylonian Tower, and also the fact that he's, he's not wiped off Abraham. He's not, saying, he's not telling Abraham, how dare you? He's talking to him. Let's, let's negotiate. God may... Sh he had the option to say, Abraham, you are just a human being. I'm... I am God, I know what is the best for the humankind, believe me. But no, God is, is trying like, like a father who is running and nego is negotiating with his son and trying to learn to teach him during the act how he should do. <coughs> the same thing we can find with Moses. It begins when Moses is being sent to, to Egypt from the burning bush. And in the burning bush, again, God is summons him and said, go and release the people of Israel. And again, Moses is, is arguing. Why me? Can't you find somebody else? I, I think my brother is better than I am. How dare you? God summons you. But no, God wants that, that we will read again and again this story and we will understand that God wants that people will negotiate, people will challenge each other. And the same thing when, when Moses is uh, electing the 70 elders, as it's written in uh, Numbers chapter, chapter 11, and there is a crisis around this ceremony. During this ceremony, Moses went out and told the people the words of the Lord, and gathered the 70 men of the elders of the people, and sent them round about, 
about the tabling earth, and the Lord came down in cloud and spoke to him, etc., etc. And there it says in uh, here, but there remained two of the men in the camp. The name of one was Eldad, and the name of the other, Medad. And the spirit rested, rested upon them. And there were of them that were written, but went not out unto the tabernacle. And they prophesied in the camp. <coughs> and there ran a young man and told Moses and said, Eldad and Medad do prophecy in the camp. We, if we would stop here at the reading, we would say they are rebellious. Just now, there is only one prophet, Moses, and he summons now only 70 people. And there are two people who are just trying to give or to share their prophecy with the people in the camp. And this young man ran, probably terrified, to Moses and said, What we should do, we do. And Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of Moses, one of his young men, answered and said, My Lord Moses, <coughs> forbid them. Do something. And we should, probably the, the instinct said, kill them. Throw them to jail. Do something. And again, Moses is teaching <coughs> Joshua. And, tell, and Moses said to him, Are you, are you taking, are, are you worried? I don't worry. I encourage it. And I encourage it, and we would God that all the Lord's people were prophets. And I'm, I'm not trying to close the ideas. I'm trying to, to promote them. And I think that the best, the best place to, to see it is the book of Job. During the book, the book of Job, when when Job, is, is Job is telling, how he think God is, uh, without mercy has no compassion. He has nothing, and no he, he has no justice. And the three friends trying to convince him and trying to explain him. And then a few dozens of chapters trying to explain um, the, the reason behind the, 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 decision, the decisions made by, by, uh, by God. And Job is always trying to challenge them. And there is a, there is a dialogue, like Aristotelian dialogue among Job and his friends. And they are trying to understand. And we will always ask questions regarding the actions of God, and we will try to, to uh, understand them. Perhaps sometimes we will say, I'm trying, I'm trying to understand and I, I, I don't, but I will do my best in order to do so. Now, it's not only the book of Job. When, when we are when we are opening the prophets uh, all over the Bible, we can find that prophets always asking questions, God. And, uh, for example, Isaiah is saying, for the sake of Zion, I will not hold my peace. <coughs> for the sake of Jerusalem, I will not be still. Even though I'm a prophet, even though, God, you, you sent me, I will always, will always, trying to fight for in the name of my people. And it's not something that belongs only to the elite. It not belongs only to Abraham, Moses, the prophets, etc. It's something that we are trying to uh, absorb during the years. And I think that um, one of the, uh, the main uh, examples <coughs> is um, what is happening in Passover. During the festival of Passover, um, we put in the middle the, the command that, that Moses is, is telling to the people of, of Israel, to the Israelites in Egypt, you have to tell your son what happened. But it's not that I'm putting my kid uh, next to me, in the chair next to me, and I'm telling him, listen, this is what happened. The service of Passover begins with questions. And in every Jewish family, they are looking for the youngest boy or the youngest girl, and he or she is standing on the chair and asking the first four questions that opens the service of Passover. And 
the beginning of the Passover is how is this night uh, different from all other nights? Why? Why? Why everything is so different? Why everything is everybody is gathering? Why there are so many um, new uh, actions around the house during the last two weeks? What is happening? And this is uh, this is the main the main night when when there is um, let's say a sacred mission to every to every father to every mother to, to teach his, uh, their kids because and to explain them guys we have to tell stories but the good, the good story open with the good question now when all, whenever you you enter to a, a yeshiva hall and you see people learning together the Talmud it's not like entering to to a, a library at the university at the library in the, the university you enter and there is a quiet and if you won't be quiet the librarian will tell you to be quiet in the yeshiva you enter and there is a noise there is an argument people there are clashes clashes people are, are, are learning loud and I'm asking questions and you will answer and and you will see that when you see the structure of all the of the of the Talmud, you can find that it's built by questions and answers, and questions and answers again and again, again and again. Why? Because there is a huge difference between learning the rules and learning uh, the the questions that lead you to the rules. And I must say that the the genes that entered through from Abraham to Moses to the prophets to Job to um, to the Talmud uh, scholars enter to the Israeli uh, DNA and I would like to conclude with a wonderful uh, piece that I got from a colleague who is working in Intel the, the well-known chip uh, company and uh, since it's a multinational company, they have a manual how to deal with people from other societies. <laughs> how to work with Irish, how to work when you get to India, to China. And there is also a wonderful piece, how to work with, with Israelis. And I think that uh, in, during this uh, conference, it's also uh, a good tip for you. And it's written as follows. Here are some tips for establishing the effective relationship and communication with people from Israel. Present ideas clearly and consistent. Expect to be cut off regularly <laughs> during a presentation. Israelis prefer to ask questions and discuss issues immediately rather than wait until the end of the presentation. And it's best to pause and respond to them. Israelis are generally fond of debate and will typically discuss any topic very passionately. <laughs> Visitors are often taken back off by the tone or the loudness of the discussion. <laughs> Don't be afraid. It's a part of our DNA. Thank you very much. <laughs> there is a freedom of speech. <laughs> So the earlier we leave, the earlier the supper will be. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> the earlier we leave, the earlier the supper will be. But never mind. It's your uh, opportunity to ask questions to an Israeli. <laughs> yes, please. I just wanted to say I very much enjoyed your presentation. It was very well done. Thank you very much. You began with that great quote about um, the mother saying, did you ask a good question? And you kind of developed your whole presentation around the value of questioning and discussing and debating. And uh, very nice. I'm teaching public speaking also. <laughs> it's unfair. That's fair. Yes, please. You know, I have to say that we're talking about points of contact. Yeah. And in my tradition, in the Zen Buddhist tradition, questioning is, is the path. Mm -hmm. mm. 
you question, 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 the more fierce the In fact. order to get an answer? Uh, or that there is a reason for just question, asking the question? The asking the question provokes realization. I don't want to limit it to answers. Hmm, interesting. Hmm. So, hmm. so yeah. a koan is a question in mm -hmm. Zen tradition. It's a question that doesn't have an answer. It has a response. It's a lived event, and it's in the life of questioning that you follow the path. So I, I you know, I wonder about overlaps between um, <coughs> questions and certain ways. <coughs> valuing the questions more than whatever content you might get. I think that any believer has to ask himself a few, a few good questions. It's part of being a believer. Because um, if I believe that there is a God, and he is, a, he is a righteous, and he is just, and so I have to explain myself a few issues. Um, I can tell you that um, sometimes we expect, you, we expect to get answers to all our questions, but sometimes we have to be more humble in order not to expect to, for those uh, answers. Um, and I can tell you that I've, I've read just a few, a few years ago about a, m a meeting that was uh, took place here in Israel between two Holocaust survivors. One of them was a rabbi. His name was Rabbi Amital. And the other one was the le leader of, of partisans in, um, in Kovna. His name was Abba Kovner. And he was um, secular. And he met him and he said, Rabbi, how can you believe in God after the Holocaust? And he said, listen, I'm a believer and I believe in God. And as a believer, I, I have to expect and I have to accept the fact that since he is God and I'm only a human being, sometimes I can't understand him. But you, who believe in the spirit of the human, how can you believe in the human kind after the Holocaust? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so sometimes, sometimes everyone has to ask questions. And we think that the life of, of the believers, perhaps it's, it's easier. Like the, the Arabic sentence, it's uh, Allah. everything is coming from God. But sometimes the fact that I'm saying everything is coming from God, I have to explain myself, if he's such a good, as, as I think, he's a good God, what is the explanation for it? Thank you very much. It was a great pleasure. Thank you. So before we, before we let the people clear the table for supper, and this will mean that the light at the end of the tunnel is not a train, but supper, uh, I, would, I want to make a short announcement. First, I thank, thank all of you. It was a wonderful day, very, uh, very interesting and very illuminating. And uh, after supper, we go to the hotel. And those of you that are still jet-lagged and are not tired enough, or people that had some cancer, uh,